Mother's Day is a good day for me to make some personal observations about the life of this dear church. I, I have permission to say what I'm about to say. I would never do it without getting prior uh, permission. But when I became the pastor of this dear church some 37 years ago, it did not take me too long that two families stood out to me in a very real and positive way. They stood out because of the love that the kids had for their mother and their dad. The first one was Jean and Gloria Atkins and their two daughters, Cindy and Stephanie. They were my neighbors. I went by their house twice every day. Cindy and, and Stephanie were 10, 11 years old. But it was obvious that they loved their mother and their dad as well, but they really loved their mother. And it was obvious that their mother and dad loved them. Now I discovered that not only did Cindy and Stephanie love their mother, but their mother loved her mother who lived one street over. Gloria's two daughters had honored their mother and Gloria honored her mother and it became a secret. What a joy it was for me to watch that over those years. Their two kids are married now, and those two have, uh, have their own children and, and grandchildren of their own. In fact, those two turned into eight. The tradition of love for mom and dad continues on. The second family is Jim and Joyce Darris and their children, Ann and Brian. You just heard Ann sing. They too were my neighbors those many years ago. Brian and, and Ann loved their mother and their dad, and it was so obvious. And their mom and dad loved them. But then tragedy struck. Their dad had a massive car in there and died suddenly. Joyce was suddenly left a 50 year old widow. Ann was a student at UCF and Brian was in the master's program up at the University of Florida. And I'm not sure I have ever seen two kids reach out and care for their mother like Ann and Brian did during those days. I think it could be said that they put their own lives on hold to care for their mother. After 30 years, they're still doing that. They're sitting right here today with their mother. And I want to thank you, Ann and Brian, for being an example to the rest of us. Bless your heart, after all of these years, thank you that you're still giving your life to your mother. You're an example to a lot of us. 
And I thank you. I know you want to clap, and you can go ahead and do that. They are a perfect example of what God said in the Ten Commandments. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long on the face of the earth. These two families represent this dear church, a loving church, on this Mother's Day. So thank you, Jean and Gloria, and allowing me to uh, uh, illustrate your, your life and, and uh, Joyce and her family as well. Now, in the, in the book of Ruth, the book of Ruth, if, if you want to turn with me, you can look in the index and, and find out where we are. But I, I want to I begin this time in the book of Ruth with this phrase. Listen. What happens when two women love and share the same man? Now don't let your mind run wild. Let me say that again. What happens when two women love and share the same man? I want to tell you the story. You can read it when you get home, but let me just walk us through it on this Mother's Day. You will read that a husband and wife lived in Bethlehem, and they had two sons. During this time, there was a severe famine in Bethlehem. The husband's name was Elimelech, the mother's name was Naomi. The two sons was Malon and Kilion. Elimelech had, had difficulty trying to make a living and, and buy food for his family. And so the family moved over to the land of Moab where there was food. They did not have the famine that Bethlehem had. They had not been there very long, and I, I thought about uh, Ann and, and Brian and Joyce as I was putting this together. They had not been there very long until uh, Naomi's husband, the father of these two boys, had a massive coronary, and he died suddenly. Naomi was left with two boys in a strange land. Over time, over a 10-year period, these two sons fell in love with and married girls from Moab. I, we're not sure which son married which daughter, but the, the, the two girls were named Ophrah and Ruth. 10 years later, very suddenly, both of her sons died and left Naomi with two daughter-in-laws. And so Naomi and Ruth are both widows. During this time, Naomi had heard that the famine had lifted over in Bethlehem, and so she was going back home. And she called her two daughter-in-laws together and said, girls, I'm going back to my home. You stay here with your family. Oprah did. She went back to her family. But Naomi tried with all of her might to get Ruth to stay there with her family. And that brought about chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, from the heart of a, a daughter-in-law to her mother-in-law. Now, these verses are often read at, uh, at, at weddings, but, but let me read it here for us. Chapter 1, 
verses 16 and 17 in the book of Ruth. Now, re- remember who is talking. It is Ruth, the daughter-in-law, talking to Naomi, her mother-in-law. Verse 16. And Ruth said to Naomi, Entreat me not to leave thee, nor to return from following after me, for whether thou goest, I will go, and where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God, my God. Where thou diest, will I die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if all but, uh, but death should part me and thee. Now, that, that does not jive with mother-in-laws and daughter-in-laws. I heard somebody say one time that behind the success of every man there is a surprised mother-in-law. That was not the case here. You see, this this daughter-in-law loved her mother-in-law, left her own family to go to a strange land as her mother-in-law had done when she came to Moab and turned her back on her own family because she loved her mother-in-law so deeply. She left her own family. It is refreshing to see a mother-in-law, a daughter-in-law, love her mother-in-law like Ruth loved Naomi. And as a matter of fact, after all these years, uh, 77 years, I have never known this to happen. I've never known a daughter-in-law to love her mother-in-law as if she were her mother. What a refreshing story. What a great story here on this Mother's Day. And so they, uh, Naomi could not convince Ruth to stay in Moab, and so the two of them went back to Bethlehem. Two widows. One old and helpless, and the other young and foreign. Ruth's devotion to her mother-in-law is more like a mother and her daughter. But Ruth left her own country and adopted the country of her mother-in-law. Naomi was old and too weak to do what needed to be done. And so Ruth volunteered to, uh, to be a gleaner. And that was after they had gathered the, the, the grain from the field that what was left, the gleaners could come along and, uh, and gather that grain and, 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 and turn it into food. Ruth knew that Naomi could not do that. Her mother-in-law could not do that. And so she, Ruth, went out into the field as a gleaner and gathered up what she could of the grain that had fallen from the workers as they left. But in the field, Ruth met the wealthy landowner and and, and he was talking about her behind her back. And he, he asked the other workers, who is that girl? And they said, she is the daughter-in-law of Naomi, who came back from Moab, and she's living with Naomi. Daughter-in-law, mother-in-law, 
both widows. In the process of time, you know where this is going, but, but, but follow along with me. In the process of time, when, when Ruth got back to, to Naomi's house, she, uh, she told the story about this man. She said, I met a man named Boaz, and he, he owned the, the, the fields where we were. And, and Naomi's eyes brightened up. Her ears perked up because Boaz was related to her now deceased husband, Elimelech. And so there was this connection. So she, when, when the next day she went back to dream, Boaz had said to the gatherers, intentionally let some grain fall on the ground so that that this Moabite woman can gather it up and take it back to her mother-in-law. And they did that. And, and she went back with so much grain that she had trouble carrying it and was trying to explain to her mother-in-law what was happening. Her mother-in-law was very wise. Naomi saw what was coming down the road and And she taught her daughter-in-law, Ruth, how to flirt with Boaz. And she taught her well. And after a while, these two lovebirds fell in love. And then you, you can read all of this in these, four, in these four chapters. But before Boaz could marry Ruth, he had to buy the land that, that Elimelech had. And in the process of time, he did that. He, he bought the land. And, and with the land came his daughter-in-law, Ruth. And so, in the providence of God, may I say that again? In the providence of God, God was orchestrating this experience. They were married. And the marriage eventually produced a son who became the grandfather of David, the king of Israel. Look at chapter 4 and uh, verse 13 uh, through 15. And and let me let you watch it as it closes out here. Ruth chapter 4 and verse 13. So Boaz took Ruth, and she was his wife. And when he went unto her, the Lord gave her conception, and she bare a son. And the woman said unto Naomi, Blessed be the Lord which hath not left thee this day without a kinsman, that his name may be famous in Israel. And he shall be unto thee a restorer of thy life, a nourisher of thine old age. For thy daughter-in-law, which loveth thee, which is better to thee than seven sons, hath borne him. And so Naomi took the child and laid it on her bosom and became nurse unto it. And the women, her neighbors gave it a name, saying, there is a son born to Naomi, and they called his name 
Obed. He is the father of Jesse, and Jesse is the father of David, who became the children or uh, the, the, the king of Israel. Now I started out with the phrase, what happens when two women love and serve the same man? As unique as this is, you would have to say that only God could have orchestrated this experience. The two women who loved and served the same man is the, the mother-in-law and the daughter-in-law, and God made it work for his glory. A great story for Mother's Day. Amen. It's such a great story. And I, I pray that God has used it to make an indelible mark on your mind. And from this point on, when you come to a Mother's Day, you will remember the story of Naomi and Ruth. When two women loved and served the same man as mother-in-law and daughter-in-law. How do, and I ask God this, how do I give an imitation with this kind of story? I mean, can I say if your mother-in-law is here, your daughter-in-law, can you uh, go out to love? Maybe you're widows. Could you be willing to, to follow in the steps of Ruth and Naomi as a mother and as a daughter-in-law, a mother-in-law? I don't, I don't know. I, I don't. It's, it's very seldom that I don't know what to do. But I really don't know. I don't know how to extend this invitation. But if God has spoken to you and has asked you to do something, I'm going to ask you to do it. Let me close with a, 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 an experience out of my own life. I was preaching in a revival. And, and the, the, the first service was cold. Every word I said hit the back of the wall and came back to me. And folks sat there and yawned and said, get this over with. That's what I felt. And so he came back that night, and it was the same thing. On Monday night, it was the same thing. And so I got along with God after the Monday night service, and I said, God, these folks don't want me here. I need to be at home. But I've come a long way at the invitation of this pastor, and God, I'm going to ask you to do a miracle. It's going to take you to do it. And so... On a Tuesday night, I preached with all of my heart and the Holy Spirit of God fell. Now here's the illustration of the point. I didn't know anything to do except preach the message and extend the invitation. From over here, a man crossed the aisle and walked up to another man and, and hugged him. And they wept. And from over on this side, a lady came to the center to another woman, and they, they hugged and wept. I did not know the story. From those two movements, the Holy Spirit of God fell. And, and what a revival meeting we had that night. It was 11 o'clock before we got out. It became a confession time. What I didn't know what to do, God knew, 
and God took it over. What, what I did not know, I found out from the pastor later, and he said, I, I should have told you this before you got here. He said, we, are a, we were a divided church uh, over personalities, over decisions that have been made, and we have folks who did not speak to anybody for, or to other people for five years. It's been that kind of place. And I said, I ought to bend you over and kick you for not telling me that before I got here. He said, I should have. Forgive me. That was all in the past then because God did what needed to be done. And that church, uh, after I left, the revival continued and the pastor would call me on a Monday for about a month to tell me what God had done. You, you see, I didn't know what to do. But God did. So, uh, let me give this invitation. If God has spoken to you and has asked you to do something, you do it. Uh, maybe you're looking for a church home and this is where the Lord would have him serve you or have you serve him. Then, then, then I would encourage you to come, a transfer of letter or by baptism or by statement. Maybe you're, you're saved, but you've never been baptized. But there is a decision that, that you need to make. And, and so I, I leave it between you and God. Whatever it is, whatever it is, do it. Just do it. Let's bow for prayer.